So this morning, if you will open up to Romans chapter 8, we are going to continue our study there. <laughs> where we're going to learn this morning about what's called the mortification of sin. Uh, it's a big word, but it just simply means to put to death. And, and that we are called as believers now to put remaining sin to death. This is really a call for all-out war against sin. We, we've talked about a few weeks ago not managing our sin, just kind of trying to keep it at bay, not letting it get too bad, letting people notice it, uh, that it hurts us in certain ways. It, this is a call not to manage it, but to mortify it. It is a call in every believer's heart to put it to death, to, to just kill it, to starve it. And so I feel like Isaiah, when he gets that vision from God, and he's like, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, is in my own heart, uh, it's easy to let up on the assault against sin. We're to kill it, and we're to annihilate it by the Spirit of God. And I live among a people as well who we've been rocked to sleep maybe in this battle. Me and a young man in this church prayed that God would awaken all of us this morning to this great high calling in battle. We want to kill it. We don't want to just whine about it. We don't just want to dislike the fruits of it. Uh, it's not enough to just wish that it was gone. It's not enough to just read books about it or even to comfort each other in it. But, but the, the true spirit wrought work of mortification is strangely absent in the church in America. And my prayer is that it would not be at this local assembly. And so I'm calling God's people to an all-out war against remaining sin in our mortal bodies because our, our passage is going to tell us some really hard things. The one who's not doing this, he said, uh, it, the, the flesh that's controlling you will lead to death, and that's going to be an eternal death. And the ones who are putting to death by the Spirit, he says that that leads to life, and I will explain that. There's a lot to understand in that, but what I want you to see is this is a very serious battle. God has answered my prayer beyond what I could have hoped or thought for a revival of 2020 as I was worshiping. I just saw like four or five of you sitting in these front rows who were redeemed during 2020 and 2021. So many of you basking in the grace of God and getting it and starting to believe it that I'm not under law but under grace. And it's filling your hearts and, and new believers falling at the feet of Jesus on a consistent basis. What is Paul's goal of this letter? The obedience of faith. The obedience that springs from faith. And so many were set free in Romans 6 and 7 and understanding it. I've, I've had many of you say, Romans 7 was so encouraging to me uh, with the battle against remaining sin. Robert wasn't one of them, but there was a lot of people who came and encouraged me. Uh, that, that really helped them in their journey. But now this morning we'll see what God has given us to battle against the remains of sin in us this morning. And, and I want you to catch this. To fight this sin, God didn't give you a formula. He didn't even give you a strategy. He didn't give you a pithy little sayings. that You get these little sayings and that's all it takes to fight sin. But I want you to hear this morning, He gave us His Holy Spirit. And last week we learned that it, he dwells inside of us. He's taken up residence within us. He's put him right inside of you. And that's a power. That's God himself dwelling in you to put to death the deeds of the flesh. I, I'll take that over anything else. I have the Holy Spirit for this calling. And that spirit is the same spirit that dwelt in Jesus and raised him from the dead. And he will raise us up to life on the last day when the trumpet sounds. And so that same spirit dwells in us. He's taken up residence to begin the work of cleaning house, of sanctifying his children and cleansing out sin and defilements. We, we're not left to our own resources to fight against remaining sin. That's the best news you could hear. We have divine resources for this battle. When I hear someone say, I just wonder if I can overcome this lifelong sin, and I just think to myself, I wonder if I put a stick of dynamite on an ant, if it would kill him. I pray that you would know the power that dwells within you. Southside, we have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within us. 
to start this holy war against the remains of sin within. And I want Christ's conformity in my own heart desperately. And I want it in every heart in this church. And what we're about to see in these verses is so beautiful. <clears throat> I pray that God would teach us how to mortify the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit. And so we're going to pray and ask God for that. Father, I come before you this morning. Teach us. Lord, every born-again heart hates sin. We want it out. We want it mortified. And we realize it will only come by the Spirit. And yet the Spirit awakens things in us and causes us to do things. And so, Lord, we're, we're, we're seeking that wisdom of how that works. And I pray that you would do that in, our, in the two weeks ahead. Teach us, show us, for, for the fruit of sin being killed by your Spirit and the lives of your people, and that it would put you on display. We would be more like Christ, and many more would be brought to this sweet Christ as a result. And so God, meet us. Take any tired and discouraged saint and revive them again in this amazing truth. Lord, let them quit looking to their own resources, and this morning their eyes would stare at the resource of the Holy Spirit who dwells within them. God, meet us here in the Word, we pray. Amen. I want to give you your outline for this morning. We're going to be looking at Romans 8, 12 through 13, and Paul's going to give us five elements that must be understood to have victory over our sin as believers. And we're going to look, there, there's a foundation that you must have. Who's the audience that Paul's writing to? Who, what is the duty that he's calling the sons of God to? What are the means that he's given us, the Holy Spirit, and what are the promises, the promises of life and death? So let's take up the foundation of this verse. I'm going to have to work through this today. I, I made the mistake of sitting outside in the smoke yesterday. So just work with me and don't listen to the coughing and just think about these words. The foundation of this verse, look at me in verse 12. So then, so then, you know what that could be translated as? Therefore. Therefore, what is it there for? And this call, therefore, is to put to death the deeds of the body. And I just want you to catch this. It's not just hanging out there and dangling. Believers, go put to death sin. Go kill it. And many think that way. That's all you have is that one command and there's nothing else that exists. I'm going to go fight sin and kill it and you're going to lose. There's something that you got to get first. And this is the difference between Christianity and world religions right here in this verse. And so what is that? Well, in verse 1, we saw that there's no condemnation right now for those who are in Christ Jesus. The condemnation that you deserved, all of it in verse 3, was poured out upon the Son of God of God. That is the, the therefore, you are not under God's condemnation. In verse 2, you're no longer uh, in the, the flesh and controlled by the, the, the death that you were under, and now you're under the spirit of life. The Holy Spirit ruling and reigning in a whole new realm the believer is brought into. And then we looked at that Hina clause, which is the purpose. With all that salvation and setting us free from the rule of sin for what? in order that we might be able to keep the requirements of the law, which is to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbors, yourself. That's what God has set us free to live as children of God, to keep the requirement of his law. And he says the way you do that is because we don't walk by the flesh. We now walk by the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. We used to have a mindset on flesh, all we could think of is the seen and the temporal and my pleasures and what will make me happy. And God has brought you out from that realm. And now you have the mindset of the spirit, which is I'm alive to God. I have life and I have peace with him. Romans 8, 1 through 3. And that spirit dwells within us now, we saw last week. So how do I live now that I'm according to the spirit? with him dwelling in me and leading my mind to be set on the things of the Spirit, the things of Christ, the mind of Christ, the things of God, his word. How do I live in the Spirit? 
And in a body last week that is dead because of sin, a body that is dying, a body that has remaining sin, and we fight and we struggle and it gets sick and it gets weak. How do I live in that state? Uh, I said, well, I'm no longer in the flesh, but the flesh is still in me. I still have an enemy within. And I still have bents and propensities to sin from my own body. I'm prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love. I still have sin remaining in this body of mine. Well, what do I do with all of that is the question. Well, most fight this remaining sin in their own strength. Unguard. And and have you found that you're no match for your remaining sin? Maybe just a show of hands, seriously. Okay, some of you still think you are. I caught a couple of you just saying, I won't amuse pastor. You are not going to make me raise my hand. (laughs) Here's the battery. I dare you to knock it off. I'm coming after that battery before we're done. If you're newly saved, there's such a sweet fire. And there's really little struggle with sin because you're just so on fire. And as you hear the word more and more and it begins to dissect and go in and learn, you start to realize the depth of remaining sin and how much it tricks you and deceives you and that you actually do still sin. There's somewhat of a civil war within The Puritan Stephen Charnock said, I start my day waving palm branches saying Hosanna to the king, and by the end I'm crying crucify him. My resolutions, he says, sometimes seem like crystal. So then, so then stand on this foundation of justification. We've got to stand on this gospel that Jesus has done all to set me free and make me right with God. You are fighting forgiven sin. You are not under law any longer to perform it. You are under grace, accepted by God. You are not in the flesh, but you are in the Holy Spirit who dwells in you by faith. Stand on that foundation. So then, on that foundation, let us enter into war. So I got to have you standing on that foundation or you're going to lose this battle. I stand on Christ, the solid rock, loved and accepted. Amen? Amen. Let's look at our second point, the audience. This one's an easy one in verse 12. So then, brethren, uh, those who are already children of God, this command is to God's children. I'm not fighting sin to become a child of God. I'm fighting sin because I am a child of God. The reason I enter into this battle is because I'm already saved. I'm, I'm right with God. I've been accepted. I'm not fighting for my acceptance, but because I am accepted. It's the only religion that you begin at the very beginning accepted by faith in Christ. And so I am fighting sin, not so I can get accepted, but because I am. Understand that nuance. And what, is that, what, what, what that does in the battle is now I battle in confidence. As I fight this battle, you know what I fight? There's now no condemnation for me right now in Christ Jesus. So even as I enter into the battle, I stand in that reality. Nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus, not even sin. I enter into a battle that even sin can't separate me from this love that God has for me in Christ. So this command is to brothers and sisters in Christ. Third, what is being commanded? That you are putting to death the deeds of the body. Here's your duty, child of God. We're going to spend the rest of our time on this point, and and next week we'll look at the means being the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to try to figure out how these two work together. It's, It's tricky. And Paul starts by saying then, we have an obligation to the Spirit, and that's implied in our text, is it's saying you don't have an obligation to the flesh, but you do to the Holy Spirit of God to put to death the deeds of the flesh. And but what, but what, what is clearly stated and repeated and emphasized greatly is Paul wants his hearers to hear this. Brethren, to know something really important in this endeavor this morning. Brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. And so we are debtors no longer to this flesh. I am not under obligation to pay it anything. We don't have to listen to its orders any longer. What Paul has shown us in Romans 1 through 3 is we were under the dominion of sin. We were under its rule. We were in the flesh. It ruled us. It controlled us. It dominated us. 
Your minds were on the things of the flesh. That's all you thought about. You lived as if there was no God. Get the most toys. Let me make myself happy. That's the condition we came into this world. And Paul said you were hostile to God. You would not subject subject yourself to the law of God. You weren't even able to do so. And you cannot please God in the flesh. That was our condition. I want you to hear this. That rule and dominion ended. When you came to faith in Christ, it ended. His work and merit merit were imputed to you. Your sins were imputed to him. His righteousness was imputed to you. And the Spirit took over the rule and reign of your heart and your mind. You have a new management. It's not the flesh. It's the Holy Spirit of God. And Paul wants you to make the so then. You are no longer under obligation to the flesh, brethren. You don't have to listen to it, and you don't have to follow it any longer. You don't have to give your allegiance to it any any bit. You owe it nothing. You've been emancipated. I was thinking of slavery, a a slave after the Civil War. Maybe he didn't hear that, that, that the victory had been won and the proclamation of emancipation happened, and he's still serving his master. And his problem is, He doesn't know that slavery has been abolished and he's just still serving his master. And then what you need to do is show him what is legally true of him. You have no obligation to your master any longer. You're done. Your service to your slave master is legally over, thus practically over. It's, It's done legally and practically now. You don't have to serve him any longer. That's your case. Legally done. Practically, I don't have to serve this slave master any longer. You never have to listen to that voice ever again. That's freedom. Thanks be to God. We're done with that life. We owe nothing. I don't have to listen to its lusts, its passions, its directives. It's a feed me, follow me, listen to me. I owe it nothing. I don't owe you a thought, a glance, a word, or effort. We've been emancipated by the one who was, uh, came to this earth and was condemned in our place. He set us free. I'm no longer a debtor to sin. And so I wanted to try to give you a few examples. I think the first one isn't very good, but I'm going to try it anyways. When I played basketball in high school, I play, played for a JV coach. Most people started with JV and that didn't go right to varsity except Jim Tinsley, of course. He, he played varsity as a sophomore. Is he here today? I had to give him some trouble at least. So guys like us played JV, and we listened to this coach for a whole season. And then I remember when I started playing varsity, this coach kept telling me what to do, and he was contradicting the head coach. And And for some reason, I just felt like I had to listen to him. And then one day it clicked. I have no obligation to listen to this coach any longer. I'm under a new coach. And it brought me great freedom. That's weak. <clears throat> How about a military example? Let's say you had a commander in chief and you served him and you had to follow his orders. Whatever he said, you did. And then one day he got court martialed. I don't even know why, but court martialed. He comes back into your barracks and says, Attendant Hut! And you say, Wait, I'm no longer under your obligation. I don't have to listen to your commands, I owe you nothing. Bark out your commands if you want, but I am not under obligation to listen any longer. I don't have to listen to sin any longer. I'm out of its jurisdiction. It's been court-martialed. And then think how Paul used this word earlier in his epistle. He said it in Romans 1, 14. I'm under obligation, same Greek word, both to Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. I'm a debtor to go tell all men of the free grace of God that has saved me and set me free. I'm indebted to the gospel of grace to go tell it. And now he's saying, you're not a debtor to sin, to follow it and listen to it and go uh, do whatever it asks you to do. You're out from under it. Now I'm under, I'm not under its obligation. I owe it nothing. It's much like the law. (laughs) What do you owe the law now, believer? This is what we learned in Romans 6 and 7, nothing. Christ gave it its full requirement, and you owe the law nothing. You owe sin nothing. You owe it nothing. Well, what do we owe then? Am I under any obligation now? 
Well, Paul says, yeah, you're under the obligation of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit whom God has sent that's dwelling in you. I am now a debtor to God. I have an obligation to God. He's purchased me with his own son. I belong to him and his spirit dwells in me. Not in the sense that I'm trying to pay back grace. Grace pays debts. I don't owe that. But I'm no longer a debtor to his justice. I do not owe God's justice even a penny. Jesus paid it all. But I am a debtor to God's love and to God's grace. And Romans 13, 8 through 10, owe nothing to any man except to love. How much more God? This is what brings the fulfillment of the law. I'm a debtor to love God for how he loved me with his son and what he has done for me. I'm under obligation to love God. And so I just want you to ponder what a debtor you are to sovereign grace this morning. If God had not willed, you would still be in your unbelief. Let the cross remind you of your obligation as you watch him hanging in your place. I'm under obligation to his forgiving grace. I'm under obligation to be led by the Spirit and controlled and filled by him. I now have an obligation to the Spirit of God. And it's astonishing how much gratitude a man feels for one who has done him good. Oh, I'll do anything. I'll pay you back. I'll, I'll, I'll drive you. I'll do anything. The infinite goodness and mercies of God, I'm forever grateful. Amen. One hymn writer said, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. I'm a bond slave to Christ. You are no longer under obligation to the flesh. You've been bought with a great price. You're in a new realm. You're brought into a spiritual realm. And you're compelled now to serve God. You owe the flesh nothing but to put it to death. And I'll say that again. You owe the flesh nothing but to put it to death. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this so well. He said, you can't look to the cross and go on living in the way that put him there. You cannot look at this cross and keep living in the way that put him on that cross. I'm no longer a debtor to the flesh, but to the Spirit of God to kill everything that killed my Savior, sin. And my question as we begin this morning then is why do we play with it then? Why do we pet it? Why do we feed it? Why do we pamper it? Why do we kiss it? Why do we think on it? Why do we test that which killed our Savior? Why do we manage it and not spare it? Do you remember when they, they spared Agag the king and the prophet took the axe and started hacking him? <laughs> spare no sin. Put it to death. Kill it. I pray that we would not, we'd spare the life of no sin that remains in our body. I'm not a debtor to it any longer. We do not make sin our friend any longer. I'm in a death opposition with sin until I die. It is not my friend. Do not make peace with sin. And if I'm walking by the Spirit, and if I have a mindset on the things of the Spirit, if I'm in the Spirit, everything Paul's been teaching us, I will hate sin because God hates sin and he dwells in me. And by the Spirit, we're to put to death the deeds of the body. And next week, we're going to spend the whole time looking that that is done by grace through faith. And so uh, hold off for one week on that piece and we will just kind of examine this piece this morning. So what is our duty? What is our duty? But if by the Spirit... You are putting to death the deeds of the body. You will live. It's time to look at how to kill the sin that we saw in Romans 7. We have an enemy within. We have a traitor in our own body that will not be fully eradicated until we die or Christ comes back. There's remaining sin in the believer, not reigning. But what do we do with it? Well, we put it to death. We're in a lifetime battle against sin. And the Puritans kind of broke this down into 
two ways, and I think they're biblical, so worth repeating. Here it's to mortify. Mortification. What do we do with sin? Put it to death. Kill it. Starve it. Strangle it. Put, it, put the, the indwelling sin of the flesh, our dethroned nature by the power of the Holy Spirit through the means of grace, which stir up faith. And next week we'll see it's by faith that we're going to put these things to death. It's a present tense in our verse. Uh, be doing it continuously, not one time. It's, it's again and again, the rejections of sins and its solicitations. It said sin has no members of its own. You have to give it your members. Quit giving your members as servant boys to remaining sin. And this is done by weakening sin's root, suppressing the rising of inward corruptions by turning a deaf ear to its voice and restraining outward actions. John Owen, who wrote a whole book on this, said the believer's goal is to unceasingly starve and subdue his remaining sin nature, seeking its gradual annihilation. He does this by God's grace. God's grace. All the while knowing sin won't breathe its last gasp until the life is over, and that if we ever let up in its attempt, it heals its wounds and recovers its strength. Let up, feed it, and you'll see this dethroned monarch will, will, will come like a roaring lion upon you. And the other is what we'll see next week is vivification. And that's just a big word that means to, to life. One is to kill, this gives life. And it's to stir up the graces, the heart and affections to Christ by the means of grace. It's what Paul meant to fight the good fight of faith. It's greater desires to keep the love of Christ alive in my heart through his word and the means of grace. So we'll keep learning to mortify. I need something greater to push out these temptations and desires and solicitations. And that's what the means of grace are for. And I will flush that out next week. But I just want to show you quickly how Paul will do that in our section of Scripture. He says we're to be led by the Spirit in verse 14. The Spirit's going to lead us. He gives us a spirit of adoption that cries in your heart, Abba, I'm a child of God. He's my daddy. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. I'm his. I'm saved. And, and that we're fellow heirs with Christ. Or that, we have, that suffering is not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to us in the last day. That we live in a hopeless world that's been subjected to futility. And it looks empty and broken. And as I look at it, he says, we've been saved in hope of what's coming. And when he comes and sets all things free. He says, the Spirit prays for us and intercedes. The Father's working everything for your good in your life. There's a certainty of glorification in this five chain of grace that we will look at. And predestination ending with justification and glorification. He's for us, it says. He gave his son for us. How will he not freely give us all things? Who can bring a charge that will ever stick against his elect? Who can condemn you? Who can separate you from the love of Christ? And all of these things stir up the heart to love God and to make him bigger than these sins that are chasing you and dogging you. So all of Romans 8, as we look at these, these beautiful truths, they should just be saying, I want that. I love God. I want to follow him. This salvation is so comprehensive. This is better than what sin is tempting me with. And so this is how we're going to put to death the deeds of the flesh is by that vivification and the means of grace that keep our minds and our hearts in the love of Christ. So it's a battle to kill, and it's a battle to vivify the graces of God in our life. The Spirit makes us alive to God and to hate sin and not be at peace with it. If, you, if your best friend is sin, you have not come to Jesus Christ. It makes us love God from that and to love others. Sin is against such love. Sin is not to love God. Sin is not to love others. We, the whole thing has been the fulfillment of the whole law in verse 4. That's what all this is about. How do I keep the requirement of the law? How do I love God and love others? Well, there's something that's going to keep me from that. And it's called remaining sin. 
You know why you don't love God and love others the way you want to? You got remaining sin that, that makes you want to love other things and not God. And you have remaining sin that makes you get frustrated with believers and want to get away from them and gossip about them and, and, and not forgive them. And you've got remaining sin and lusts and desires that are fighting you against the fulfillment of the whole law, to love God and love other people. And how is that going to take place then? I've got to mortify these sins within that fight that on a daily basis. I was just reading 1 Corinthians 13 and looking at the opposite of it. So flesh is love is not patient. It's not kind. It's jealous. It brags and is arrogant. It acts unbecomingly. It seeks its own. It's provoked. It takes wrongs into account. It rejoices in unrighteousness. It hates the truth. It won't bear all things. It's full of unbelief and it won't endure. And that love will always fail. That's the flesh and that's what remains and what we need to put to death by the Spirit of God. That's what remaining sin is and does. And if we walk by the Spirit, we can fulfill the requirements of the law to love God and love others. John Owen said, In the sanctification of believers, the Holy Ghost doth work in them, in their whole souls, their minds, their wills, and affections, a gracious supernatural habit, principle, and disposition of living unto God. And he, he, he guides us in every area to live unto our God. And that's going to be the power that we're looking for. So I've been praying all week that this passage would wake us up to the battle that's before us. It is so easy to get lulled to sleep in this battle. If COVID taught me anything was how quick sin is growing and moving in our nation and the persecution that's coming upon us. And it's just, wake up. Wake up. Quit drifting. Quit meandering. What would happen if a whole church took this seriously? Quit being conformed to this world. The traitors must be put to death in this war. Do you have a pet sin, a protected sin, one that's off limits? Just that God would wake us all up to not be friends with sin, to be its enemy, to put it to death by the Spirit. I look back to Romans 6, 14, that sin shall not have dominion over you because you're not under law but under grace. There's a way to not be ruled by this unloving spirit and attitude any longer and it's by not being under law, but being under grace, living under this gospel. And, and, and so don't lose major foundations like that. Foundations like right now, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the so then, as we enter into this battle, you don't, you don't lose those things. You fight to kill it because of those things. So those who want to say, it's all up to me, I just need to be disciplined to put to death the deeds of the body. Just be honest. How's it going? And then there's those who just say, man, I, I don't do anything. I just rest. The Spirit does it all. Thank you, Jesus. You're, you're losing. But just read the verse. But if by the Spirit, you are putting to death the deeds of the body. And so what we got to find is this balance that you're to put to death the deeds of the body but you do it by the Spirit, and that's, that's what we got to figure out, and little pithy sayings will not fix that understanding, and so next week, that's going to be my goal, but let's dig in just a little more, and then we'll close out and come back next week. I wish we could just keep going. So let's dig in a little more and look at this in detail. We're putting to death the deeds of the body. Does, does Paul just kind of throw that out there? What's the deeds of the body? I'm so confused. What's a deed of the body? Well, we, we looked at it a long time in Romans 6. And so Paul is dropping terms now that he's been defining very clearly. And if you'll come back with me to verse, let's go to verse 11 of chapter 6. The first command in the whole book of Romans is even so reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Get it in your heart and believe I'm no longer under that rule any longer. I died to it. I'm alive to God in Christ by the Spirit. Therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its epithumias. Don't 
let these remaining sins that are still in you, you've died to sin, but there's remaining sin that, that is, it's, has these desires that, that you, you want good and bad things in, in the way God made you. And epithumias are you're desiring something more than God. They're too important and they're making you sin against God. So sin is trying to get you to desire something more than God. And that's what sin is. I want this more than God. And so we have these remaining things within us that are, are trying to get us to desire things more than God. And then verse 13, don't go on presenting the members of your body then to sin, this remaining sin, the deeds of the body, as instruments of unrighteousness. Don't give your members to sin any longer. What are we trying to kill? These impulses and desires in our body to sin. You still have them. They're not reigning. They're remaining in you. All of your lusts. We looked at that. Sin has no members of its own. It's trying to enlist your members to serve it. And you have desires contrary to God wanting to use your members to sin. Take your mouth and slander. Use your eyes to lust and your hands to kill and your bellies for for food. Your thoughts to have self-pity and pride and be downcast. Be my errand boy. And so listen to me. The sin is saying, use them for sin. And this is what happens to you all day long with greed and lust and approval and fame and power and superiority over others and uh, self-righteousness. And all of these things are these desires that sin is trying to get you to act upon. And what Paul is telling us, I want you to hear, is your biggest enemy is you. That's what we're fighting. The devil gets nowhere. He doesn't come in until Romans chapter 16. It's, we're, this is the problem. This is what the devil comes after and, and gets us. And so here's, here's our battle. I must make war against the sin that remains within me and not just give in and listen to it and be a debtor to it all of my days. That's American Christianity. And so that's the deeds of the body. That's what we're battling. What do we do? What do we what do? We, do? We, we put them to death. Like many wars that you've seen, they, they cut off the supplies and all the areas so that the people finally surrender and die. That's what we're going to do with sin. This is so big. I've been teaching this for 20 years. The deeds are not your main problem. You're fighting the flowers of sin. I got to quit doing this. I got to quit doing that. And this is telling you it's the roots, the root of what causes you to do your sin. It's your heart. It's your desires. It's the idols of your life. Jesus said, from your heart flow the springs of life and bad speech and all of these things against God. That's where our battle's at. So to put to death the deeds of the body, they they come from somewhere. So don't just fight the flower of sin. Go to the source and the lifeline of the problem. And you need the Spirit to do that or it will never happen. Two weeks ago, it is the flesh that was hostile to God and it won't submit to Him. I want pleasure and sin. I don't want God. It must be slain. And how do we do that? What I want you to see or to consider as we close out is we do it by the Spirit. He is the means that we can put to death the deeds of the flesh. And in my own journey and watching many others, few get this. We fight hard in our own strength and are simply no match for these sins. And you will not make true progress. You mortify nothing, you just simply manage it. And next week, we're going to take this up because you're called to do something, to not listen to your flesh any longer and to mortify it by the Spirit. And I think God has shown me in His Word the key that unlocks this. And if it was up to me to get justified, what I've learned in Romans is I have no hope. And if it's up to me to mortify sin, I have no hope. This chapter is that it's the Holy Spirit who keeps you. And he will keep us from being overtaken by sin, but rather the slow, gradual killing of sin in our bodies is his aim. And he will begin the work of slowly putting these to death in our lives. And so there is a way that I fight hard against sin and its risings and callings to give it my members 
but it's the Spirit. And the key of the whole epistle is the obedience of faith. The obedience that springs from faith we will look at next week. And I, I, what the law, could, the law could not save us, we learned that. But the Spirit can. And the way that He puts to death the deeds of the body is by the gospel believed, by the body of sin being broken, by the Spirit taking up residence within you, by the Spirit taking control of your thoughts, desires, and hopes as we look at His Word and see the beauty of Jesus Christ. And this sets us free then to keep the requirement of the law, to love like no other person on the face of this earth from the source of God Himself. So please come back next week well-rested, prayed up, maybe even fast, with a hunger to understand how do I put to death the deeds of the body, these remaining lusts and desires, wanting to use my members. How do I put that to death by the Spirit? And that will be next week. So I'll just close with one last quote by Owen. The believer's goal is to unceasingly starve and subdue his remaining sin nature, seeking its gradual annihilation. He does this by God's grace, all the while knowing sin won't breathe its last until life is over. And that if he ever lets up in his attempts, it heals its wounds and recovers its strength. I wanted to keep that quote in our minds. And so let's seek God together. And we're going to learn how to do this, not in our own strength, but how God uses us by his spirit to kill this stuff. Father, we, we thank you that you have caused our hearts to hate sin. And every child sitting here this morning who's been indulging in it has guilt and shame and discouragement. And we thank you that you've made us alive, that we just can't be friends with it like we were when we were unbelievers. And so God, I thank you for that. I thank you that you have caused us to want to be rid of all the sin in our lives. And I thank you that you've taught us our own flesh is no match for these desires. God, we can fight them in our own strength and wrestle and kick and, and we will never get anywhere but external moralism. We'll never get to the root, the heart, these wrong desires and motives that dwell within us. God, but by your Spirit who dwells within us, we can have greater desires and power to starve these things until they die. And so God, we look for you to do the work that no human being can do. And I pray that you arouse a hatred of sin based on this gospel that we've been staring into, the beauty of its face. God, let every heart here declare war against sin by grace through faith. And so God, we thank you. We thank you for these holy desires. And we confess our frustration of how many times this indwelling sin leads us into the gutter leads us to think something else will make us happy besides you. God, give us eyes to see, to keep ourselves in the love of Christ, to have this greater desire that nothing would ever be able to lead us away from it. Lord, we need your spirit, his role to shine a floodlight on Jesus Christ. I need him through this word to show me the glory and the beauty of Christ to where everything in this world grows strangely dim and my lusts and desires just want him, just want relationship and know him deeper and to love him and to serve him and follow him. Oh God, create in us desire for him and him alone. And so God, we thank you for this beautiful gospel, this beautiful Christ, this beautiful spirit who shines on him and a father who has decreed this whole plan. We love you and we worship you and we serve you. And it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.